Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Voris. Just a reminder that Church Militant has the best, most insightful coverage of Pope Francis' synod that's underway in Rome this month. Our Rome correspondent, Jules Gomez, breaks down the happenings each day on our popular program, Rome Dispatch, hosted by Brad Eli. So just click on that provided link below each day to keep up on everything. It's the whole month. Now, most Catholics have zero idea that St. Paul was a social warrior clamoring for Catholics to not sit on their keisters and get busy with changing the world. Most Catholics have no idea about any of that. It wasn't about just getting to heaven individually for Paul. It was about initiating the kingdom of heaven here on earth, right here, right now. Catholics as a whole are amongst the most complacent, sit back and let the world happen types that you will ever meet. Maybe, maybe, a hundred years or so ago, that could pass. But with the communist agenda seizing massive control around the globe, there needs to be a wildly new approach. And Paul lays it out in his letter to the Ephesians. The problem is, so few Catholics even crack open the Bible, they have no idea that St. Paul is sounding an alarm about getting in the fight in this world while you have this life. Spiritual warfare happens in the temporal world. What makes it spiritual is the effects are everlasting, but the dirty work, so to speak, happens right here on earth right now. For this reason, Church Milton is offering our first ever master class on the Bible specifically, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where the great apostle is crystal clear about every bit of this. And that's available to you live starting on October 22nd and running for the following six consecutive Sundays at 4 p.m. Eastern each Sunday. Classes will be live on Zoom, but will be downloadable for those of you who can't be present during the live sessions. One ticket covers your entire household, so homeschooling families bring your kids for a college-level biblical theology education. Understanding Scripture should be foundational for Catholics. It's our book, and that's why we're bringing you the experts, like Chris Plants, a biblical scholar, to teach you everything you need to know. And joining us now on set, Chris, how are you? Good, thanks for having me. All right, first question before we get into the Ephesians proper information is, uh, why do you think, you know, Catholics have this reputation of, you know, oh, you know they don't really ever read the Bible, don't need the Bible, don't blah, blah, and uh, something Protestants actually throw at Catholics all the time. What do you think uh, is responsible for, it, it's not really an aversion, it's just a, I don't know, lack of desire, indifference, or whatever, towards Scripture on the part of many, many Catholics? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, like uh, Jerome said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. And I think it's just um, sort of uh, uh, an idea that, well, the church has sort of given us the doctrines, they've given us the dogmas, they do most of the work for us. But really, as Pope Benedict said, those dogmas are nothing other than the church's infallible interpretation of scripture. So when, when the magisterium gives us these dogmas and doctrines, mm -hmm. they're supposed to act like a light to encourage us to go to scripture so that we can have the proper interpretation of scripture. So um, far from the magisterium sort of just doing it for us and we can be indifferent and allow the scriptures to sort of just go their way, um, the church is there to aid us and to encourage Catholics to, um, you know, Vatican II has the, in, in Dei Verbum, it talks about reverencing the scriptures mm -hmm. as we would the Lord's body. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you never sat down in adoration. It was like a year. When was the last time you went to a Eucharistic adoration? Yeah. Oh, it's been a year. A year? Yeah. And if we're supposed to reverence the scriptures as we are the Eucharist, how often are we sitting down with scripture trying to study it as we sit there and pray in Eucharistic adoration? So the liturgy of the word is intimately tied to the liturgy of the Eucharist. And I think the reason why so many Catholics actually are um, sort of faulting in their, in their appreciation for the Eucharist. You know, the bishops have this Eucharistic Congress. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to get them fired up about the Eucharist, which is the second part of the liturgy, you have to get them fired up about the first part of the liturgy, right? right? The Eucharistic, the, 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 the word, um, right? The inspired word will lead us to the incarnate word. There's a, a, an approach, if you will, that uh, 
in liturgy of the hours, for example, what people know sometimes as the breviary, uh, the whole thing's centered around scripture. It does really seem to be something of a, a, a faulty premise that the church doesn't really engage with scripture. Uh, all the liturgy of the hours, and if, you, and if you're a priest or a religious and you actually are following the way you're supposed to, you're, you're diving into that five times a day. Uh, and, uh, and of course, laymen saying the morning prayer, evening prayer, whatever, like we do here at chapel. The whole thing essentially is scripture. There's a couple of little things that aren't, a couple of little prayers. Uh, so, I mean, the church is always emphasizing scripture. It's in all over the mass. It's everything. And you have this other uh, uh, notion behind all of this that as you're doing, I mean, the church grants a uh, partial indulgence, mm -hmm. sometimes a plenary indulgence for the amount of time you're sitting with scripture. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, you know, meditating on it, not just reading it like you're reading a book. I mean, it is a book, but uh, why does the church put such emphasis on scripture and, of course, wants us to incorporate that into our devotional life? Well, I think it's because it's the source of divine revelation. In order to understand Christ, in order to make sense of the Eucharist, mm -hmm. of who Jesus was, yeah. you need to understand scripture. Jesus just doesn't fall out of heaven, right? right? He comes to us at the end, at the climax of a very long story that begins in Genesis 1 and 2. And so if you don't understand that story, you don't understand Christ. Bingo. Right? And so in, I think what happens is the, church, the church's liturgy um, is filled with Scripture. Her prayers are filled with Scripture. But oftentimes we don't recognize that Oh, the church is citing Isaiah, right. you know, the church is alluding to Ezekiel, yep. uh, you know, oh, by calling us the holy ones, the church is sort of evoking the entire Danielic oracles, right? right? As we are the ones that Daniel saw, you know, seated with, um, uh, seated with the Lord and, and now have been called to sort of rule and uh, rule the nations, represent his rule on earth. So I think that, I think that it's key to understand that what we have in scripture is not merely just another sort of catechism, a list of dogmas. Right. Christ comes to us in the midst of this very long story mm -hmm. and it's complex and you can't simplify it. You have to allow the story to zig and zag and weave in and out and you have to follow it closely, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's, it's like hunting for a, a treasure. And if you get one step wrong along the way, say for example, a perfect example of this, Scott Hahn just pointed this out recently. He said Protestants sort of completely forget of the, 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 the covenant to David, mm -hmm. right? And if, if you miss the covenant to David and the centrality of that, of course you're not going to understand why Matthew 16 makes the sense it does. Right. When Jesus gives Peter the keys of the kingdom, yeah. you know, you're like, okay, well, yeah, but let's get into debates about, you know, whether or not, what do those keys really mean? Right, exactly. <laughs> All that stuff. And you're like, you're missing the point. Right. Matthew has just developed this argument that Jesus is the son of David, right. fulfilling not just the Abrahamic uh, promises and not just the promises made to the, you know, th to all of Israel, but also specifically to David. Mm -hmm. So when you get to Matthew 16, sort of Matthew leads the eye up to where when Matthew 16 lands on that page, you should be seeing that as the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Right. Right. So, so that's what I mean by the treasure hunt. If you miss one step, you yep. take away 2 Samuel 7 and you're not noticing it, then for Protestants, they miss the papacy entirely sure. and the role of the papacy. So, and, and this can happen to Catholics as well. Obviously, we have the tradition and the dogmas, right. which sort of are, are like a cheat sheet, right? <laughs> They're a cheat sheet where we can go and find uh, the light for interpreting scripture. Now, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes the church won't rule on a passage or won't rule on a, a, maybe a specific dogma infallibly or definitively. And so you have to use the church fathers as, as, uh, as lights and so on and so forth. So the more we can get familiar with the story itself, all the various parts and all the church's liturgy or prayers and everything will start to fit together. All right, let's shift to the New Testament and something we've got exciting going on here. We're going to be rolling out shortly. Uh, New Testament, third of it written by St. Paul. That's right. After he wiped the blood off his sword from killing Catholics. That's right. Um, is there a, 
uh, we're going to be talking specifically about Ephesians. That's right. And you're going to be leading this class and all that. What what is why did you settle on Ephesians? Of everything he's written, which is, of course, everything, uh, you know, practically every letter in there, with the exception of the last few, uh, all come from Paul. Why Ephesians? Because Ephesians will expose your ignorance of Scripture. Paul is, a, as Peter said, Paul is a very difficult writer. Sometimes what he says, you're not sure why he said this versus that. Mm-hmm. Why did he, if you go around to Catholics and you say, how would you formulate the gospel? Okay, I go to USC or Rams games. There's always the Protestant guys out there with repent and believe the gospel or else, you know, you go to hell. And that's their summary of the gospel. Or if you go talk to them and say, what, you know, what's the gospel? Jesus Christ, uh, you know, is the, is the one mediator between God and man. Put your trust in him so that you can go to heaven when you die, which is actually a great formulation of the gospel. Um, of course, they're missing a bunch of other stuff. But, um, but if you go, and I, I, I would suggest the audience do this, go to your fellow Catholics and say, if somebody said to you, how would you formulate the gospel, what, what, would, what would you say? And just sort of tally how they would articulate it. Now, when you go to Ephesians, Paul says that he is about to unveil for the Ephesians the hidden mystery from eternity Mm -hmm. that has been locked in the heart of God, alluded to in the Danielic oracles and alluded to Isaiah's oracles, the whole story in the Old Testament. He's about to unveil it. Mm -hmm. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, he's going to unveil the Trinity. He is going to give us the formulation, at least allude to it, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the mystery hidden from all ages that God has been waiting to unveil. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe, maybe it's not that, but maybe it's the Eucharist, transubstantiation, God's true presence in our midst. Is it the Eucharist? Is it the Trinity? Is it, is it the hypostatic union? But when Paul goes to formulate this hidden mystery from all eternity yep. that's been hidden in the heart of God... He says, he says, and this is the mystery, how the Jews and Gentiles are members of the same body and partakers of the promises given to Abraham. It's like, wah, wah, wah. You know, you're like, <laughs> whoa. You're like, this was what is supposed to be unveiled, how the Jews and Gentiles are part of the promises to Abraham and now form the one fam- worldwide family of Abraham in Christ, the Messiah. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I would have said the Trinity... Why did you point to ecclesiology? I would have said, or to the church, right. as this union of the nations. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of, if, if, you, if you're not tracking the story of scripture, Paul will expose you in Ephesians. Because yeah. he'll say things, you're like, why, did, why is that how he intar- intar- articulated the gospel? So Ephesians, now I do Bible studies in Los Angeles and, and online. And I always say, you cannot come to it. One of my New Testament studies Unless you do the, at least a Genesis Exodus study with me, right. because basically Matthew and Ephesians, are, uh, these new, the New Testament's not going to make sense until we go back and reread Genesis. But I found that if people do want to just skip to the New Testament, I take them to Ephesians so that they can realize so you can blow they're up not, the world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they can realize. I actually can't understand this. He's talking about Abraham and the Jews and the Gentiles coming together. I mean, like this is the gospel. And so it forces them at the end of of Ephesians to sort of say, wait, I actually do need to go back to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Mm -hmm. slowly work your way through Mm -hmm. to the very end. Then you pick up all these different pieces that were were lying just below the surface. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they're dangerous pieces because they're involving politics. And people do not, they want to keep politics and religion apart. But in the first century, that was impossible. There was no such thing as do, uh, 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 that, that sort of split. Right. So what you, un, what you, what you realize uh, in Ephesians and elsewhere when you follow the story is that, oh my goodness, this isn't just about going to heaven when you die. Right. This is actually about God's rule on earth right. now. Yep, right, here and now. Here and now. The, the New Age, Paul articulates this in his other letters. The New Age is overlapping and interlocking in the Old Age. So, and it's marked, Paul's, Paul identifies the boundary marker of the, the, the Old Age and the New Age as war, mm-hmm. warfare. That's what, that, that's what he's leading the eye up to in 
most of all of his, in all of his letters, even in Romans, where he talks about sin, how would you identify sin? Well, it's a breaking of the moral law. But when you go to Paul, he identifies it as a power. He's almost, he's almost saying it's a person. And of course he's alluding to a person. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So you have to think, okay, so Paul thinks that the dark powers are sort of, of, are sort of pulling the strings on the governments of, of, of human lives. Mm-hmm. They're, they're sort of, you know, the politicians and the government officials, Caesar, uh, you know, the Roman Senate, you know, Tiberius, they're all just puppets mm-hmm. for the dark powers. And so Paul articulates this, basically picking up the old, from the Old Testament, this cosmic warfare motif. Mm-hmm. But, but it doesn't just stop. It's not just spiritual. Because once, the, once Calvary... And then with the resurrection, defeats the dark Lord. Then it frees those who have been rescued by him and had their images renewed to rule the world on God's behalf. Mm-hmm. And that's the final part that's a little dangerous for Catholics. Oh, yeah. Right? Because they're like, Christendom, really? It's like, well, if not Christendom, you realize you're going to get the dark powers Absolutely. ruling. So this is why, you know, baptism was called a sacrament in the early church. Mm-hmm. It, in the very first centuries following, it's called a sacrament, a sacramentum. The sacramentum was only one thing in the ancient Roman world. It was started by Julius Caesar. Mm-hmm. And the sacramentum was the oath, the yep. seal that was put on Roman soldiers who would flee from the front line of battle. Why, why are the early Catholics picking that up? And, and, and even Paul refers to baptism as a seal. They're picking that up from the Roman Empire and they're throwing it on baptism that when you've been baptized, yep. you've been sealed with the sacramentum oath. So this is why Paul's saying to Timothy, you know, stand fast, stand fast, because, because you've been sealed, you can't run away. The Roman, Caesar would do this because, and, and the, the, the Caesars that followed him, because the guys in the front line would flee from, from battle. Sure. So if you got caught, Yep. You had the seal on you. That's correct. If you were caught by the enemy. If you were caught by the enemy, you'd be tortured and killed. Mm-hmm. If you were caught as a deserter by Caesar, it'd be worse. It would be worse. Yeah. Right. So, so all of a sudden, it's like, are early Catholics allowed to use sacramentum that politically, you know, mm-hmm. and, and martially charged term, and use it for the sacraments? It's like, guys. They didn't see politics over here and religion over here. Correct. And I think what's happening in our in our culture today, I'm kind of going on a tangent, is that. Though that line is being drawn yes. in a visible way. You're like, you know, well, what do you want to do? You still want to, you know, the Republican Party in California is sort of compromised on all these issues. It's like, you know, but California, Catholics in California could kind of wake up and realize we need Christ more than anything. Yeah, yeah. We need Christendom. Mm-hmm. Sorry. That's a good point. No, I want to pick up on some of these things because we talk about this all the time here. And, uh, you know, sort of calling it what it is. It's communism now. I mean, call it sort of whatever name you want. But uh, it's the same dark lord behind it that was behind the Roman Empire. 100%. So it just keeps going on and on and on. Chris, thank you. We'll come back tomorrow with a little bit more on this and what people can learn. So stay right with us. Thank you. Right, so please sign up for this special offering from Church Militant today by just clicking on that provided link. Make this a priority. Spend a few hours in a class setting actually learning and stop being passive. Catholics aren't supposed to be passive. The world is falling apart and too few seem to know or care to do anything about it. Don't let that be you. God love you. I'm Michael Borse.